all smiles there. How are you today? I'm fine. I feel good. How are you doing? About the same. Fine. Feel good. Uh, you know, nothing, uh, nothing extraordinary, but nothing bad. So all is well. Well, I got a big weight off of my shoulder. I was doing the Central Texas Beekeeping Association Bee School this weekend, and I put together 250 slides. I taught all day, and uh, now that it's behind me, I'm just really happy. So Wow. Yeah. Um, so minor oopsie on my part. For some dumb reason, I thought that was the 29th, which wouldn't make sense because that would have made it a Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I was planning on doing an advertisement for them, and uh, that, that didn't do it. Um, okay. Oh, well. They had I 700 had, people. 700 people. They did good. Yeah, they did really good, actually. That's that's their biggest one That's ever. huge. That's huge, actually, for, for all of the things in Texas. That, uh, yeah. that outdoes the Texas, the state of Texas's that's things right. that they do. So, <laughs> well, congrats to Central Texas beekeepers. <laughs> that's right. And I was thrilled because I was teaching Beekeeping 101, and uh, how to assemble hives. So I was able to kind of like tell people a little bit more about natural beekeeping and the alternatives to uh, different styles of hives and just kind of, you know, give them a different story that they hear everywhere else. There you go. There you go. That works. Mm -hmm. So I had a very bizarre, um, th the conversation was not bizarre. The thought process that the conversation invoked <laughs> was bizarre. <laughs> but I was talking to a friend and former consultation client, and she mm -hmm. was telling me about the different splits and things that they see recently coming up as a, uh, how do I want to say it? The new trend or fad that is out there on all the beekeeping forums and all that kind of um, stuff, you know, and there's, I know, right. But there's, there's lots of different ways to do a split and, and yes depending on your goals, just like with anything, beekeeping is beekeeping. So depending on your goals and everything else, there's not necessarily a right or a wrong, but this one sent me down a rabbit hole, like of spiraling thought to the point where I just became indecisive. <laughs> like I okay. straight up just stopped. It's, so it was, it's not bad. It starts off legitimate. And so I, I kind of wanted to, you know, since how these are beekeeper chats, I wanted just to hash it out and talk about the, the ups and downs or pros or cons of, of this specific setup. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if it invokes the same sort of uh, rabbit hole reaction with you as it did with me. Because the problem, I think, is, you know, after, after you get to a point where you know too much, then you can second guess yourself thing. endlessly, though. Well, at a, right, certain, right. Yeah, at a certain level, yes. Um, you're you're absolutely correct. There is no end to knowledge, but on certain topics, you can get to a point where there's so much input that then suddenly you become indecisive. Like this, yeah. Yeah. So here's here's what ended up occurring. So the the thing that's going around out there is talking about how to do a split by using a queen excluder and shaking the bees and that's segregating video them. On YouTube. Yes, that's the yeah. YouTube video that's making the rounds. Yes. Yeah. And so in the, the core concept of it is they want you to take all of your capped brood and put it into the bottom box, take all of your open brood, put it into the top box, shake all the bees into the bottom box, put a queen excluder over the bottom box, and then the top box back up there with the, the basically just all the babies that need it. The, to the right. theory is all of the nurse bees are going to then move up into the top box to take care of those babies. Mm -hmm. And after you, you know, let it sit there for a day or two, you can then come and pick up that talk box and just walk off with it and set it down to create a split. Because now you know that you have your queen in that bottom box. She's been segregated because you put your queen excluder there. You've got all of this brood down there. And you now have all the nurse bees who are not going to fly. And this is their big caveat. Those nurse bees are not going to fly and return to their original home. So you're not going to lose any foragers, quote unquote, in this process. But they also give them a queen, a mated queen on right. that video anyway. Yeah, you can. And well, and the queen wasn't really, <laughs> that wasn't my concern. <laughs> I mean, I can come up with an endless number of ways to solve the queen issue. So if you do exactly what they said, you take it and you set it over <laughs> there, you give it a new queen. That's perfectly fine. You can allow them to raise their own queen because you've segregated all of the, the nursery I don't know why I can't talk today. The nurses. All of the, the, the eggs, the larva, and all of the 
bees that are uncapped, all of the stuff right. that the nurse bees are taking care of. And the nurse bees could then turn around and create a queen from those resources. So you could do it that way. Now, that's it in a core concept. Do you see any problems right off the bat with just that setup? Right off the bat, you mean taking into account the queen thing or not? Not not taking into account the queen. Or you can in one instance, there's one well, instance one you could, the, but. One of the biggest issues I see with that is a colony is made out of several age groups. And you're really de de um, um, taking away the older bees when you're doing it this way, which are the foragers. Right. So for a while, <laughs> they're going to rely on their food sources that are in the hive, and that's really going to throw them off. And that's also going to do another thing. That's going to push the nurse bees to mature more quickly into through the different ages. And it's really an imbalance. It's not really the best. Uh, and if they, you know, I mean, I, I just think that it's taking a toll. Right. Anyway. So that that right there was the number one first thing is I was like, wait, yeah, you're, you're not going to have the nurse bees leave and go to the other colony because they've never left, but they're still nurse bees and they're not going to leave, which means you no longer have any incoming food source. That's you it. don't have foragers bringing resources back into this colony. So that was my first thing where I stopped and I was like, okay, well, hang on. If you did it exactly like that. <laughs> and so, so that's what started the rabbit hole. That's what started the whole, well, okay, yeah, that, that's all true. But now let's think of the repercussions that this is going to have. And that was the first thing was you have no adult bees. You have that's no right. bees. You have adult bees, so, quote unquote, but they're all nurse bees. You don't have any bees. foragers bees so that are- only have house bees and mostly nurse bees. Right, exactly. And, you know, so you've kind of shot yourself in the foot in that regard. Another thing is another part of that imbalance is that all of the bees that are there and all of the larvae that are there have not been capped yet which means mm -hmm. they're not even 10 days old necessarily. They need a lot of food. They're going to need a lot of food. And, and again, resource wise, they may not have the resources and they don't have anything incoming. But if they're not even 10 days old and they haven't been capped, that means there's still 12 days or 11 days to go minimum mm -hmm. before they get cat or before they emerge as an adult bee. So you have no influx of adult bees. Yeah. If you switch back over and you look at the other half that you left behind, it's about to quadruple in size because you left all of the cap bees there and the queen's not going to have anywhere to lay. So they're going to kind of go through a little bit of a stasis themselves, but all of those bees are going to emerge. Mm -hmm. And suddenly that colony is going to be like hugely overpopulated. So you know why they do this, right? Uh, in that video anyway, those are commercial beekeepers. Of course they, they are. are. <laughs> they're going to sell those splits to their customers that are going to get those unbalanced you know uh, kind of stunted kind of nukes and they're going to keep the explosive mamas that are going to make them um their business later right, right. so the pollination honey production all this stuff right now if you are a backyard beekeeper or you just have a couple of colonies and you're trying to to grow your colonies in some regards you could still balance things back out and that's fine but ultimately did you do yourself any I don't think it's any you, easier. You, you to... didn't do yourself any favors because in, if anything, you've just pro postponed the work that you're going to end up having to do later <laughs> when you could have done it all at once when you did the split. And very often you have to find a queen for them, right? Because those nurse bees, they're not, you know, on their own. There's unless you've shaken or put in additional bees in there enough to rear queens, which takes a lot of resources mm -hmm. for quality queens anyway then you shot yourself in the foot. If you give them a queen, then you're going to have to go find, buy a queen or grow queens yourself. So it's more involved on that end of the process as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so as I went through this conversation and I was talking about, okay, well, but if you did this, well, but then that, that causes this, well, but, but then also there's that, you know, that's like how the whole rabbit hole started. Right. right. So I started talking about, well, <clears throat> yeah, you could do that. And that, that would be fine. But in the long run, though, that other colony is going to be overpopulated. This one's not going to have enough population. You could really balance that out right from the beginning. And so then I started talking, well, so why don't you do at least two frames of the solid capped brood and then three frames of the open brood? And that way, at least they're going to have some new adults emerging where it will justify some of the nurse bees graduating to foragers. Right. Um, but then you're starting to get into the realm of why don't you just do a traditional split? 
<laughs> right. I mean, you have to balance it out anyway to, you know, or strengthen it in the end, equalization or otherwise. Yeah. Then, you know, why not do it? Right. The reason they're not doing it that way is because they are commercial beekeepers and their goals are different from that, from that of backyard beekeepers. They have different constraints and yeah. that's fine. That works for them. What we're trying to do here, and I'm assuming that's what you're trying to do, is we're trying to tell people the 95% of beekeepers that are actually backyard beekeepers, hobbyists and homesteaders, they don't have to do it just like the way the commercial beekeepers are doing. There are simpler ways in effect for backyard beekeepers. It looks simple, but it has unintended consequences. Right. Now, here's one of those unintended consequences that I talked through with my friend was that, okay, so let's go back to the, the core concept of this. You opened it up. You've in essence, touched every frame because you put all of the cap brood in the bottom and all of the open brood in the top. You've already disrupted them. You've already, yeah, you've already <laughs> done as much work as you would have if you were going to sort it out and do a traditional 50 50 split. Yeah. But you shook all the bees down into the bottom. And I asked her specifically, I was like, how many different times have you ran into an instance where there was a queen where the queen shouldn't have been? She fell out of the box. She was found hanging in a cluster underneath the box. She was on your veil. She was on your suit. So you shake all the bees down into the bottom box and you, you put that queen excluder up there. What if you accidentally squish the queen? What if the queen falls out of the colony? What, what if, if she did fall out of the colony and she climbs back up and goes into the top box and then she's not in the bottom box where you thought she was? You know, like there's so many different scenarios where you could screw up right. because you're shaking all the bees. If you were just taking the frame with the bees on them and not jostling them and moving them from box to box, that's one thing. But when you shake them all down in there, because you're just trying to, I can't find her, or I don't want to take the time, you could end up hurting her, killing her, losing her, making her mad, and she leaves. There's a and whole the, lot of issues there. And the reason they do that is because they're doing, I think they said like 200 at a time. I forget how many they're doing. And, and in your own operation, unless you've got that many colonies, if you have only just two, four, 10, 20, it, like you, to your point, it's safer and probably just as fast, if not faster, to actually balance things out and better for the donor colonies and the splits that you're doing. Right. Now, sticking with the, the queen theme, what happens in nature when the colony divides itself? They send the old queen with a 50 to 75% of the bees, if that's just a prime swarm. Yeah. Uh, secondary swarms will send less with a virgin queen. And then you're left with the leftover uh, uh, swarm cells and uh, queens, virgin queens will emerge, they will mate, they come back and they inherit all that old comb, the food, the brood, yeah. and a lot of the older bees. So in nature, the original queen leaves, mm -hmm. but in your split, you kept her with the original colony. You didn't yes. move her with the new split. So if you add that variable in there, well, now you got to go through this whole thing and you got to find your queen. So now you've invalidated the shaking, but we've already said shaking could actually cause more problems. So mm -hmm. you find your queen and you put your queen where you want her to go. Now you're good to go from that standpoint. But again, we're back to the, why don't you just do a regular split? <laughs> Part of the goal of the uh, reproductive cycle in this, uh, the superorganism is to uh, renew the, the queen's age, basically get them a fresh queen as they send out the other one to try to find another cavity. That, that swarm will have about 75% chances of failure in nature. What they're really counting on is giving them a little chance, 25%, but really giving the remaining colony with the fresh queens uh, another head start. But you're right. I mean, you, you don't get that. You keep the old queen in the box. Right, they don't really right. care when they do that, though, because at some point they're going to requeen everything in the fall. The commercial beekeeper is, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the backyard beekeeper, though, if you go through that process, you leave the original queen in the box and you do your split, you could have actually ended up causing another problem, which could be a problem and may not be a problem. So we've already talked, if you did it their way, you've got all this capped brood in there that's going to emerge. We've discussed in the past on the main show before how a single frame of bees, solid capped, is almost equivalent to a package of bees. So think about the giant influx of adult bees you're about to have. They will open up the space as they emerge out of there so the queen could come back and lay again, but that population is now so overabundant and it has all the foragers it's yeah. going to immediately turn around and want to split anyway and do a natural swarm because you didn't take the queen and you didn't take enough of the adult population to justify them feeling like they got right. reduced <laughs> that is if they realize those they don't realize those are not mostly you know there's some foragers there's a lot of foragers 
and they're probably some youngish bees. But usually when they swarm, they take mostly younger, like couple weeks old, uh, you know, young bees that are about to become foragers out with them. So yeah, there's an imbalance there, but uh, mostly it's going to be older foraging bees anyway in there. Yeah. So it, it just, it kind of, it was so funny because when we started the whole conversation, she was like, what do you think about this? Should I just do this? It sounds like it would be easier. And the more I thought through it and the more we talked through it, the more I was like, I think you should just do a regular split. <laughs> yes. And that's, you know, I talked about that a lot at the B school this Saturday. Um, our, what are your goals? And everybody has different goals and that's fine, but that's what's going to inform what kind of technique and approach you're going to get with your bees, whether you treat or not, whether you're getting with Langstrother or horizontal hives, um, whether you're doing this kind of commercial or commercially oriented splits or we, whether you leverage the swarming instinct of the colony to do a split. What Les and I do, we push them to, we dare them to swarm. We get them congested. When we know the nectar flow is coming in, we watch for swarm cells. Um, if we see the conditions are getting near it, we might even do an, a little bit of an early artificial uh, uh, split, right? We know they're going to be swarming and they've got everything they need to do that. So we might take the split a little bit early if we don't have time to come back. But it, as a general rule, we love to see them build those queen cells. And then we're like, oh, here they are. So as soon as the queen cells get built, there's larvae in there, then we'll take the old queen, we'll, we'll simulate this, the swarming, we'll take the old queens and we'll check a bunch of bees in there and we are taking nurse bees, yes, but also any kind of bees that are in there, uh, because we want it to be uh, more balanced. And then we'll just kind of close back the other one and let them finish rearing their queens. So we're just going to do it that way. And the other thing we like to do is to let the, I mean, personally, anyway, Les likes to, um, uh, congest them, dare them to swarm. I like to let them grow first. So I'll give them more space. So they get bigger and bigger and stronger. And then I can do more than just one split at a time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and as you started that whole thing off, it all depends on your goals. Like, what are That's you, what exactly. are you trying to accomplish? <laughs> exactly. And what's your philosophy about rearing bees and what's your understanding of how the superorganism functions? Because everything we do, we're messing with that. Les yeah. and I are messing with that when we touch them as well. But do you want to minimize that? And if you don't know what that implies to your point, go down the rabbit hole and think this through. Think what that means for your, because it's going to impact their health. Right. And that, see that, that right there is probably the one thing that out of, out of the entire podcast, out of everything that we've ever said, that's the one thing that really I hope everybody understands is not necessarily do as I say, but mm -hmm. listen and learn how to think in a logical progression of what would the colony do. So we talk about all these different scenarios and that, that's often why I say beekeeping is beekeeping. Some of the core fundamentals stay the same, but you know, you may change the hive style. You may have different techniques. Certain things are going to work in one area where they don't work in the other area. And, you know, go out there, listen to as many different people as you can but then take all of your previous knowledge, take all of your previous experience, and put those two things together and see if what you're now hearing lines up with that. Mm -hmm. And if your experience says, well, yeah, but in reality, I've seen this, this, and this, or this has never worked for me. Well, then maybe that thing that you're watching or seeing right now doesn't apply. <laughs> I mean, could it work? Yes. Is it the yeah. best case scenario to do a split if you're a backyard beekeeper? I say no. <laughs> My favorite thing is when people say, well, I did this and, it, and my bees made it. And so it must work. Well, right. maybe you just got lucky. Right. Maybe you didn't realize the long-term implications of what's happening in your colony either. Maybe you made it now. Maybe next year you won't be making it. Maybe you're exhausting them. There, there's all kinds of things. My favorite uh, recommendation is to uh, tell people they need to think through all this intelligently with critical thinking. And for that, they need some kind of theory um, knowledge about the superorganism and how it works. That's the key to your success. And that's why I always recommend the Biology of the Honeybee by Winston. That's an old book, uh, but it's written from the perspective of the superorganism, not from the perspective of beekeepers. So you get to understand a lot better why bees do what they do and how and when that happens, what are the signs, the chapter 10 or 11, I think it is on exclusively on swarming and what happens in the hive. 
it is so informative just for that chapter i would get the book yeah it, it's it's like playing chess you have to know the options and you have to know what each role each of those different class of bees take the inside the society there with them and then you've got to think it out well, yes. if I do this, then what are the countermeasures that are going to happen? Or, you know, it, it, it applies to all of beekeeping. Mm -hmm. If I want them to get to this point, what do I need to do down here to build up to that point? If I want to do a goal of having X amount of hives, how do I get there? And what are the steps? And then also, what are the consequences and what are the repercussions? And do the consequences and repercussions outweigh the benefits? Because if they do, maybe you need to take a different course of action, different approach to it. So, um, yeah, so I just I thought it was interesting because there's always these fads that come up and go around and it's the latest greatest thing and it's not new. It's, you know, it's been out there forever, but it just oh, kind of gets no. recycled and regenerated. And um, all of a sudden it's that person's technique because that person put it on YouTube, but right. all commercial beekeepers have been doing it forever. I've heard about that technique forever, but right. now everybody's like, oh, look at this new thing. It's not a new thing. No. There's all kinds of things. like and. What kills me, and I heard a lot of that at the beekeeping school, even from the teachers, some of the teachers anyway, there's a lot of myth and, uh, uh, you know, just unquestioned recipes and truths and, and that are repeated constantly that are not necessarily true, that are not necessarily um, what works for most people. And, and we think they're recipes that the bees will read the book and this is what it work, how it works and it never varies. And, and I'm like, you know, just that's not like this. Did you know, for example, that um, people tell you the queen never feeds herself, right? No, well, she does. But she does. Actually, as a virgin queen just coming out of the uh, cell, emerging out of the cell, I have a video of them running to drink a big, you know, gulp of nectar. Like she's been thirsty this whole time, stuck in that queen cell and she comes out, she runs and she shoves her head in there. Yep. Yeah. I've, you can see that even whenever you have them in a queen cage and you're getting ready to install them. If you put a drop of water up on the top, she will come and drink from that drop yeah. of water. So mm -hmm. the, the key part with her is she does not have some of the mouth parts and the glands that the workers do, which they use to go through and create the royal jelly and then feed back to her. Mm -hmm. But she absolutely still has the tongue and all the parts that she needs to drink. And she will go drink right. nectar and honey and, you know, be it's just you. fine with it. <laughs> yes. And and same with the drones. People tell you they don't feed themselves. They do. They, they do. do. They just they just don't do it initially. As long as the, the exactly. sisters are there to wait on them hand and foot, they're happy to have that. But if they are not, they will go find they'll be on the comb with all the open nectar and honey and they're going to be in there drinking all the food. <laughs> exactly. And then, um, oh yeah, well, there's only one queen in each of the colonies. You, and it's not the truth. Yeah, it you, depends. Like, up to 70% of the time, you might have a second queen. And actually, uh, there's a purpose, evolutionary speaking, where you're swarming. Uh, sometimes the um, old queen might actually, I mean, the not when swarming, but sometimes the old queen, when they're superseding her, there you go. When they're superseding her, they're creating a new queen that's going to go and mate and come back, but they're not going to necessarily kill the old queen. Actually, very often they let her uh, die of old age, uh, but for a while they will work together. One of the reasons there's a superseder is because the original queen is not doing that good of a job there's something wrong with her and maybe the population of the hive has suffered from it so evolutionary speaking it makes sense to keep them the new one and the old one working together and powering through and, and lay more eggs than just one would otherwise especially as the new virgin queen is ramping up uh, so that they reestablish that population level there's a reason but but all you'll hear is that there's only one queen per colony yeah. so question it's what you hear it kind of reminds me, there was an adage, it's, it's an old adage, and you can change up the different scenarios and stuff in it, but I heard it repeated on um, PBS, or no, it wasn't PBS, what was I listening to? Public radio, I was listening to public radio, and uh, the adage was that a daughter and her mother were going through, and they were making like Christmas dinner, and they were making a ham, and mm -hmm. the daughter started to put it into the oven, and the mother was like, no, 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 you can't do that, you have to cut the ends off of the ham before you put it in there, that's how you cook it, it has mm -hmm. to be done. And the mm -hmm. daughter said, well, why? And she said, well, because that's how mom always did it. That's so then the daughter, yeah, yeah. So the daughter called her grandmother and said, why do you have to cut the ends off the ham? And the grandmother said, well, because that's how my mother always did it. 
So she calls her great grandmother and her great grandmother laughed and said, I had to cut the ends off because my pan wasn't big enough to fit the ham. <laughs> so it, it didn't have anything to do with how it needed to bake or what the process was. It was a necessity that started off. I can't make this fit otherwise, but then that necessity turned into this is how it is. And each generation carries that forward. But unless you know the reasoning behind it, it there's not necessarily the, the true reasoning that you think. <laughs> it's kind of like a telephone you used to make with old cans with a string. You keep it taut, right? And from one person to the other, the message gets distorted a little bit. Then you <laughs> yeah. put the next one and gets distorted more. And so anyway, I would say if you have mentors and teachers, I, I would trust the ones that are asking questions and thinking through a little bit deeper than just repeating the same old stuff if it's simple if it's a recipe they're not asking you questions i would say just be weary about that there you go so that's your lesson for the week and your assignment as well that's do right. some critical thinking think through different things that you see and hear online even things that you hear us say Think about it and see whether or not it fits for your practices and, and walk through those different steps. Play that little mental game of B chess in your head and see how it works out. So we appreciate everybody tuning in and we look forward to talking to you again next week. But until then, everybody, be good. Be mindful. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. This Hive Jive production was made possible by amazing patrons like you. And we appreciate your support. To all our Hive Jive junkies out there, you truly are the bee's knees.